Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another deep dive. Yeah. You know, we're always digging into the latest research and today we're tackling a question that I think is on a lot of healthcare providers' minds these days. Yeah, it's a big one. Should we still be using albuterol alone for asthma? Right, it's been the go-to for so long. Exactly, like it's almost automatic, right? Someone comes in with wheezing or shortness of breath, bam, albuterol inhaler. It's just what we do. But uh, we've got some research here that's really making us rethink that whole approach. Oh, definitely. The evidence is pretty compelling. So to set the stage albuterol, it's a short-acting beta agonist, right? Yep. A Saba. Yeah. It works by quickly opening up the airways, relieving those bronchospasms. Provides that immediate relief that patients are looking for. But, and this is a big but. Oh, yeah. It only treats the symptoms. It doesn't do anything about the underlying inflammation that's driving the asthma in the first place. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a much bigger problem. Exactly. So, you know, you might feel better for a little while, but that inflammation is still simmering in the background. And it can lead to more exacerbations down the road. Which is what we're trying to prevent, right? Absolutely. So that's where this idea of anti-inflammatory reliever therapy comes in. Anti-inflammatory reliever therapy. Okay, I like the sound of that. So what's that all about? Well, it's a shift away from just treating symptoms to actually addressing the root cause. By targeting that inflammation. Exactly. And how we're doing that is with inhalers that combine an inhaled corticosteroid, you know, an ICS. Like butsonide or fluticasone. Right. With either albuterol or a fast-acting laba like formoterol. Okay, so two medications and one inhaler. What's the thinking there? So the ICS tackles the inflammation kind of like putting out the fire. And the albuterol or formoterol provides that quick relief that patients are used to. Yeah, it opens up the airways quickly so you get that symptom relief while simultaneously addressing the underlying problem. Gotcha. So it's like a two-pronged attack. Exactly. You're hitting both sides of the issue. Interesting. Okay, but this sounds pretty new. Is there actually evidence to support this approach? Uh, oh, there's definitely evidence. A lot of it, actually. A recent systematic review looked at 27 randomized trials. 27 trials? Wow, that's a lot of data. It was over 50,000 patients, and the results were really impressive. Okay, I'm all ears. What did they find? Well, for high-risk patients, the combination of ICS for Motorol reduced the risk of severe exacerbations by 35% compared to using Asaba alone. 35%? That's huge. Yeah, it's a significant difference. Even the ic Buterol combo showed a 16% risk reduction. Still a good chunk. And it seems like that for Motorol being a LABA has a faster onset and longer duration of action compared to albuterol. So it's providing both quick relief and sustained bronchodilation. Exactly, which seems to be key in preventing those exacerbations. Wow. Okay, so we're starting to see why this is such a game changer. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned this was for high-risk patients. Mm -hmm. What about people with milder asthma? Is this shift towards ICS containing inhalers relevant for them too? That's a great question, and it's where the guidelines come in. You know, the global initiative for asthma, GINA. Oh, yeah, GINA. They're like the gold standard for asthma management. Right. Well, they've updated their recommendations, and they're now advocating for ICS Quermoterol as the preferred reliever therapy for all stages of asthma. Really, all stages. Yeah. So you're saying even someone with mild intermittent asthma should be reaching for an ICS Quermoterol inhaler instead of their albuterol. That's what Gina is recommending. Of course, shared decision-making with patients is always key. Of course. But these updated guidelines really reflect a shift in our understanding of asthma management. They're acknowledging that even in mild cases, addressing that inflammation early on can lead to better long-term outcomes. Wow, okay, so this is definitely making me rethink my whole approach to asthma management. I think it's making a lot of us rethink things. Yeah, and it sounds like we're moving towards a more proactive approach to asthma care. Exactly, instead of just reacting to symptoms, we're trying to prevent them from happening in the first place. And the evidence seems to be backing that up. It really is, which is exciting because it means we have the potential to make a real difference in the lives of our patients with asthma. Absolutely, but you know, change can be tough especially in medicine. We love our routines, right? Oh, absolutely. We get comfortable with what we know, what we've been doing for years. And albuterol, it's been around forever. It's like the old reliable. Right, it's familiar, it's easy to use. But we're talking about a more effective approach, potentially preventing those serious exacerbations that land people in the hospital. That's right, we have to weigh the comfort of the familiar with the potential for better outcomes. And, you know, it's not just about clinician inertia. There are some real-world barriers too, right? Oh, definitely. Cost is a big one. Mm. ICS for motorol inhalers. They tend to be more expensive than just plain albuterol. And insurance coverage can be a nightmare. 
Yeah, it's not always straightforward, which makes it harder for patients to access these newer treatments. Especially those who are already struggling to make ends meet. Absolutely. It creates a real disparity in care. And then there's the whole regulatory maze, prior authorization step therapy protocols. It could be a headache for clinicians. Oh, yeah. It adds a whole layer of complexity and paperwork. Which nobody has time for. Right. We're all busy enough as it is. So we've got inertia. We've got cost barriers. We've got regulatory hurdles. It's like a triple whammy. It can feel that way sometimes, but I think it's important to remember that the potential benefits for patients are huge. Absolutely. We're talking about potentially improving quality of life, preventing hospitalizations, even saving lives. It's a big deal. So how do we overcome these obstacles? Well, for starters, I think we need to spread the word, make sure everyone's up to speed on the latest guidelines and research. Education is key. We need to be having these conversations at conferences, in journals, through webinars. Yeah, we need to get everyone excited about this new approach, show them the data, the potential. Exactly. And we need to address those cost and access issues head on. And it all started with that simple question, should we still be using albuterol alone for asthma? Right. That one question opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Speaking of possibilities, I have another question that's been bugging me. We focus a lot on ICS for Motorol, but what about ICS albuterol? I mean, the research showed it reduced exacerbations too. Good point. It did show a benefit, just not as pronounced as ICS for Motorol. So is there still a place for ICS albuterol in our toolbox? I think that's a question that requires more research. You know, those studies we discussed, they focused mainly on high-risk patients. Right. We need more data to see how each combination performs in different patient populations, those with milder asthma, different levels of control. So let's bring it all together. We've explored the limitations of albuterol alone, the potential of ICS for Motorol, those real-world barriers. We've covered a lot of ground. We have, and hopefully we've given you a lot to think about. I hope so. You know, this isn't just another podcast episode. This is about sparking a change in how we approach asthma care. Absolutely. We want you to walk away from this feeling empowered to question the status quo, to advocate for your patients to be a force for positive change. Because at the end of the day, you're the ones on the front lines making those treatment decisions, impacting those lives. You're the ones who can truly make a difference. So as we wrap up this deep dive, we want to leave you with this. Don't let this conversation end here. Take this information back to your practice share it with your colleagues, discuss it with your patients. Keep asking those tough questions, like the one we started with, should we still be using albuterol alone for asthma? The answer might surprise you, and it might just lead to better outcomes for your patients. And who knows, maybe it'll even inspire you to share some of your own success stories. Exactly, because those stories have the power to change the world one breath at a time. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.